Welcome to the OR Today webinar series. We're excited to have over 250 registered attendees for today's webinar. Just a reminder to save the date for our fifth annual OR Today Live Surgical Conference, which takes place on August the 18th to 20th at Palms Casino Resort and Spa, Las Vegas. Join us to discover new opportunities, broaden your knowledge, and exchange ideas. Visit ortodaylive.com for more information. Let's kick off today's webinar by giving an OR Today Live surprise pack to the attendee that can tell me the answer to the following trivia question. February is American Heart Month. What is the name of the first doctor to perform the first ever successful human heart transplant? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to remind you today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education hour. To obtain your certificate, you must complete the post-webinar survey, which will appear immediately on your computer screen at the end of today's call. One lucky attendee will have the opportunity to win an Amazon gift card courtesy of OR Today just for completing the survey. Okay, and let's see who our winner is. And it is Mary Ritchie. Congratulations, Mary. Of course, the correct answer is Dr. Christian Barnard. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, Rep Scrubs. Rep Scrubs offers vendor van management and cost reduction solutions. The Rep Scrub program provides assurance that every vendor entering a sterile department is wearing a clean, prepackaged, disposable polypropylene scrubs dispensed on site, while shifting the expense of providing those scrubs back to the vendor. The Rep Scrub system offers hospitals a unique way of improving infection prevention and adherence to regulatory guidelines, reducing costs and enabling hospitals to better control and manage vendor access. For more information, visit repscrubs.com. Our presenter today is Dr. John Coots, Medical Advisor at Repscrubs. John, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Linda. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar. My name is John. I am the Chief Medical Advisor for Repscrubs. I'm thrilled to have you all with us. The topic today is what's coming home with your scrubs? The impact of unclean surgical attire. For any of you who may have participated in my last webinar, I don't want you to think it's the same thing all over again. These two slides were in that talk, and I put them in really just to highlight the history of hospital and healthcare environment attire. And, and you know, if you look at the dates on these, they're really not that old. The picture on the left is 1875. The picture on the right is 1889. On the left, this is a very famous painting by Thomas Eakins. It hung at Jefferson Medical College for years. And this is Samuel Gross, who was the chairman of surgery at the time. You can see he's operating in a tuxedo, which he likely wore off the street. All of his assistants also have formal, somewhat tuxedo-like attire on. And this was the norm back in that day. You know, a short time later, 14 years up to, across town at the University of Pennsylvania, this is called the Agnew Clinic, also by Thomas Eakins. And you can see things changed a little bit. Now, you know, now the people in the audience have somewhat formal attire on, but the surgeon and his staff have decided that white clothing somehow seems cleaner. The there's an, actually a nurse at the bedside and she's dressed in what would be the typical period era uh, attire for the support staff. I love surgical history, so you know that's why we that's why I always have these slides in here. And it's interesting to go through time as told with photographs. And if you look at this picture in the upper left-hand corner, this is the 1920s, you know. You could almost mistake this for a dinner party if you didn't see the beds along the side here. And everybody's dressed in their white coats and ties. Uh, the nursing staff obviously have long dresses on. They have their bonnets on, very, very formal. Uh, this is a little bit later in the 1930s. This is when wards became smaller and you had four or five people in a room. You can see the nurse once again, long dress, bonnet, very formal. You know, these pictures down here really, I think, when people imagine a doctor, 
This is kind of the picture that comes to mind in these in the bottom row. I mean, here you have the nurse once again in formal dress, bonnet, the physician in a shirt and tie, white coat, glasses. They're in the doctor's office. It's somewhere in the 50s. There's the cabinet with all the medicines. I mean, I think when a lot of people my generation, when I was born in the late 60s, you know, this is what you think of when you think of the doctor's office. You know, this is a very similar type environment. You have the doctor with the tongue depressor, the stethoscope around his neck, the shirt, the tie, the long white coat. Really, that was the norm for what people in healthcare wore. Now, this picture I had to put in there because I almost couldn't believe I found it. This is a group of nurses all smoking cigarettes. You know, this is somewhere in the 50s. I mean, you can't, you you still see hospital staff smoking cigarettes, but I thought this was an interesting uh, picture to put on the talk because really it was unusual in the way it was all carried out. You can see though, as time goes on, things become a little bit more relaxed. You know, this is a nurse at the bedside. This likely is an emergency department environment, I suspect. You can see that the dress is a little bit different. It's short sleeve, she has her stethoscope around her neck. She still has a bonnet on, but you can, the overall sense of the environment here has become a lot more relaxed. It doesn't seem anywhere near as formal and proper as it would just 50 years ago in the 20s. If you take one decade later, you can see the market change. You know, now you have staff wearing scrubs, long t-shirt under the scrubs. It's a completely different environment. Hair is down and hair isn't up. There's no bonnet. And then you go to present day. This is a picture outside of Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, which is where I trained. And this is right on 11th Street and Walnut in Philadelphia. And this is the norm. Uh, if you go to any tertiary care facility in the country. This is what you're going to see for a two block radius around the hospital. You're going to see people in scrubs, some in white coats, some not in white coats, different color scrubs in and out of the hospital. This is constant traffic all day long. You know, things really have changed now. I mean, hospitals are now complex environments as a byproduct of increasingly complex care and procedures. And I put these pictures up here for people to realize that it's really a completely different environment. If you go back to that picture from the 1920s and the beds along the side in a huge ward, I mean, this is an intensive care unit environment. This is an intraortic balloon pump. You see the monitor, the patient's ventilated, you have drips, uh, everything going very busy, a lot of activity. Over here, it's neonatal ICU. I mean, this is incredible. You have all these IV pumps. You have the ventilator over here. You have catheter drainage systems here. You have bed warmers. I mean, this is all, and this is, you know, the size of the patient. Look at all of this co-attendant equipment. I think the next slide really puts it into perspective for you. But this is a ward in Bellevue Hospital in New York in the mid to late 20s. And, you know, this, this just looks like an open room with a bunch of beds in it. <clears throat> There's a photo at each bed. There was a window at each bed. A nice stand in a, a a nursing table, but compare this to this, and you know, you're about, you know, if you think about the time frame, it's incredible. Um, this is 100 years later, and look where we are. It's a whole different world. And I thought it'd be interesting to highlight the hospital personnel so that people really understand what's going on. You know, in the late 1800s, in the hospital, really, you'd have a physician and a nurse. They were the predominant staff, and they did a lot of the other ancillary functions. It was a lot of physicians doing a lot of things, a lot of nurses doing a lot of things. You had minimal support staff. I mean, you did have people, but really, these two were the backbone of the hospital. In the mid-1950s, as you approached this period of time, things became a little more progressive, they became a little more complex. So you still had the physician and the nurse. You did, of course, have laboratory staff and dietary and transport. So, you know, this, this was the beginning of what would be the progression and evolution of modern day healthcare facilities. You know, now, if you look in you know, the present day, if you walk into a hospital now, there are people all over the place with a myriad of functions. 
physicians come and go. The physician, I think, as a backbone of the hospital system as they were in the 1800s, although they function as part of the backbone in terms of the staff and support, they really aren't. You know, it's everybody else on this list. And obviously, you have nurses, nurses' aides, which do a lot in the hospital and take care of a lot of functions. The laboratory staff has expanded incredibly. Um, you know, the laboratory staff back in the 50s was a couple of people drawing blood. Now you'll have you know, multiple divisions of a laboratory of chemistry. You'll have hematology. You'll have um, microbiology. You'll have blood, um, blood uh, products. It's, you know, it's incredible. Respiratory is the same. I mean, you have people doing respiratory treatments. You have people managing ventilators. You have um, people teaching um, aggressive pulmonary toilet. Security, every hospital has security anymore. Inside, outside, parking garage, and then not to mention the physician extender staff. I mean, every almost every physician anymore has some sort of extension, nurse practitioner, physician assistant. They're roaming the halls of the hospital providing care. And of course, we could never forget about case management. And they're the folks who get the patients out, get them placed, get them managed, make sure everything's taken care of, review the insurance status. So this, you can see the present day if you look at the exponential increase in staff over, you know, 100, 150 year period of time, it's remarkable. I put this slide up to, to, to kind of discuss and review the transition of hospital personnel and staff attire. You know, in the mid 1950s, if you remember those photographs, you know, things were very, very formal. I mean, the physician had a shirt and tie and a long white coat. The nurse had a long white dress on with her bonnet hat. Laboratory staff was the same. You know, everybody, everybody was dressed really um, in a formal type, um, in a formal type outfit. But somewhere along the line in that 50, 60 years, things became much more relaxed. They became much more casual. You know, the physician, nurse, all of this staff, instead of wearing formal shirt and tie every day, they became far less formal. And that really be, as a, was a byproduct of function. And we're going to see that in a second. You know, and, that, and I think those last couple of slides clearly um, demonstrated that the volume of hospital staff and personnel has markedly increased directly really as a result of the complexity of care and patient management. I mean, you legitimately may have nine, 10, 12 people taking care of one patient. If you include the physicians, the nursing staff, laboratory, respiratory, dietary, case management, I mean, one patient could easily see 12 to 15 people involved in their care on a daily basis, multiple times a day. So, you know, this picture really captures it. I mean, you know, this is the 1950s. You can look, you have the doctor and the nurse. Um, you kind of go to this casual environment, and once again, you see it's, whole, it's completely different. Um, this, I suspect, is either an intensive care unit or emergency department environment with the numbered beds. But you can see this is completely different than in the 1950s. And, you know, really, it goes back to the slide. This is a complexity of care. I mean, care is more complex. It requires more people more management than back in the 1950s, you know, the ability to solve problems wasn't as clear. We didn't know as much. We couldn't solve as much. We provided care, but it certainly wasn't what it is today. And in terms of, you know, function and efficiency, casual scrub attire has evolved into a mechanism to improve hospital function, efficiency, and organization. You know, I learned this when I was a resident, and different people in the hospital were wearing different color scrubs. And, you know, it's a subtle difference, but, you know, this slide clearly demonstrates that some of these are from um, Maryland Shock Trauma Center. Uh, this is the photo that was in the last slide. But I highlighted, and you can see different people in the slide have different color scrubs on, and that really helps determine what their function is. And if you go to hospitals who have really mastered this, everybody will have on a different color scrubs. The transport will have on purple. Dietary may have on gray. Um, nursing staff in different units, you know, the intensive care unit may be blue, the neonatal ICU may be white, 
Um, physicians typically will have their scrubs on, and some of them may be from their office, some are from the OR, which isn't ideal. Um, but everybody has a different color, and the different color really helps ec economize staff function and motion, not just for other staff members, but for patients as well. So, you know, patients are provided a key, you know, that demonstrates what color means what. So rather than ask somebody from transport if they could help them with the nursing function, they know that somebody in pink scrubs is the person to talk to if I need a nursing function. Somebody in white scrubs may be the nurse's aide that could help me do this or that. But it really has provided a lot of efficiency and economy, so to speak, to the hospital healthcare environment. You know, previously, you'd have to look at a badge, you would have to ask, and it just became burdensome. But now with this system, it's a lot better. So back in the 50s, it was easy to tell the nurse had her long white dress on and her bonnet, and the physician was usually in a shirt and tie. But if you remember that last slide, somewhere along the line, we evolved from that casual to that formal attire, and things completely changed. So as I mentioned in the last slide, hospitals began to realize that having different color scrubs allowed staff and patients to quickly identify personnel based on their role and function. So that, you know, as I clearly you know, described, described in the last slide, I mean, that was, that was the goal. Hospitals realized that identification of the personnel really helped not only the personnel, but the patients as well. And a lot of hospitals have adopted this, this process. Some of the staff doesn't like it because they think it takes away their individuality, but, you know, quite honestly, I think it works very well. So as I mentioned before, physicians, nurses, housekeeping, dietary, transport, you know, the beauty of the nurses is that a lot of it varies by location and specialty. So if you're in a hospital that has a cardiac ICU, they may have red scrubs. If you have a surgical ICU, they may have blue scrubs. If you have a neuro a surgical intensive care unit, they may have a brown scrubs. So if you see folks in that color scrub, you know that they're, that's a cardiac ICU nurse or that's a neurosurgical ICU nurse. It's quick, you know, you're quick to identify them. The physicians, a lot of times, will wear scrubs that they have purchased. A lot of them uh, personalize them with their name or initials or department. Um, housekeeping will all wear the same scrubs, which has really helped patients um, identify them when they come in the room to drop off or pick up their food. I mean, excuse me, to, to clean the room, dietary, to drop off or pick up their food. I apologize about that. And transport also. I mean, it's it's great for the nurses and the staff to be able to identify the transport staff quickly so they can come and um, and help care of the patients. I mean, it also is a security issue. I mean, this helps people identify folks within the hospital without the, the somewhat of a security concern that they're going to violate their environment. You know, when I heard it, when I saw this, I thought that was a great idea. <clears throat> it's simple. It's quick to learn. People adapt to it. Patients love it. They identify with it. And overall, it seemed like a great idea. You know, the problem is that, and I think this is something most people don't think about, is that the hospital staff often arrive in scrubs, work an entire shift, go home in the same scrubs they wore at work all day. And, you know, this is something I, don't, I think most people don't even think about. You know, they 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 often home launder those scrubs. So they work in them all day, eight or 12 hours. They take them home, throw them in the laundry, put them in their washing machine, fold them and bring them back out. You know, the issue really is, you know, non-commercial laundered systems really can't reach the temperature necessary to kill some of the bacteria that we encounter at work every day. So it begs the question, should staff leave the hospital in the scrub attire they worked in all day. And you know, this is just really to generate awareness and have people ask the question. You know, if you're working in a surgical intensive care unit and you have a patient on a ventilator with several multi-drug resistant organisms, multiple drainage systems, catheters, open wounds, and you're in and out of that patient's room all day taking care of them, and you have those scrubs on, you know, there's a high likelihood those scrubs are going to contain all of the multi-drug resistant organisms that are on that patient by the end of the day. 
And if you have multiple nurses coming in and out of the hospital, all with scrubs of a similar nature, you know, it could become problematic. You know, should staff change into non-work clothes? And, and I don't, I'm not proposing necessarily one or the other, but I think this is something that as a group we should think about because there are people walking around in scrub attire. They're, they're leaving the hospital, and you'll see in the next couple of slides, I don't want to spoil it, but they're leaving the hospital, getting in their car, stopping to get food, going to the gas station, the grocery store, the supermarket, Home Depot, what have you. And, you know, they've just spent 12 hours taking care of a patient who has multiple drug-resistant organisms that may place themselves, their family, or the environment at risk. And, you know, we, we know that this is a reality. I mean, this isn't, you know, we're not, this is stuff that has been clinically evaluated. Sorry about that. <laughs> this has been clinically evaluated. You know, these aren't, this isn't anecdotal information. I mean, this is legitimate information. You know, scrubs carry bacteria. And, you know, we see it multiple studies have shown it. Bacteria on doctor's uniforms can kill you. If you look at this, and, and I'll put this next slide up, just to highlight some of this, you know, 92%, that's 92 out of 100 people who wore scrubs to work, they leave there often with MRSA or C. diff by the end of that shift. 79% will contain some type of a gram-positive coxi. You know, obviously you worry about things like MRSA, staph epi. Um, if, if you look at this, 69% tested positive for coliform bacteria, three of which were E. coli, and you know, a lot of those E. coli are, bacteria, are antibiotic resistant, and those can be really problematic. You know, this superbugs may show up wearing hospital scrubs, this is, you know, this demonstrate once again, they found home laundered scrubs had a statistically significant higher bacterial burden than hospital washed uniforms, which goes back to the point that I said before that taking your scrubs home and washing them in a civilian environment doesn't provide the, the temperature and the, excuse me, the temperature necessary to kill some of those bacteria. Now, if you look at this, there was no statistically significant difference between hospital washed uniforms and unused new and disposable scrubs. Now, disposable scrubs are out there, and you know, dis disposable scrubs are a product of rep scrubs. But this, you know, I'm, I don't say that to highlight that product. I say it to really generate awareness about the fact that look, if you're leaving the hospital in your scrubs that you wore all day and you're taking them home to wash them, you're not cleaning them. You might be cleaning them of the gross you know, if you spilled something at lunch on them, but you're not really cleaning them of the bacteria that have clung to them. Now, this study is really impressive, and I think anybody who doubts some of this can read this, but this was a study where Gordonia bronchialis resulted in three sternal wound infections in patients following open heart surgery. And what they did is they completely broke this down. They did a deep dive into what were the common factors in these three patients. And the common factor was an anesthetist who was off the sterile field, but was in each case. And she had home laundered scrubs. And three patients developed Gordonia bronchial sternal wound infections, which potentially could be fatal. Um, so I think this highlights the whole topic, which is look, if you're working all day, and you take your scrubs home and wash them at home, you're not cleaning them. I mean, you're cleaning them, but you're not really cleaning them. What you're doing is, in reality, is providing a vector for infection transmission. You know, so this, there's no, in this slide I had in my last talk, but I mean, we just, you know, I think about it all the time. I mean, there's so many regulatory policies, there's so many quality issues you know, there are complete industries which are built around hospital and healthcare quality, but there's no regulatory policy or quality inspection measure which addresses this. You know, the sign, and I don't want to read this, but I'll read this last sentence. The you know, further research and policy that address this topic is imperative to protecting patients, healthcare providers, and the health of the public. Sorry about that. So, you know, I, and I agree. I think, you know, this is a topic that really, I think, needs further evaluation and management. I mean, this is a big deal. 
I put this up really to, you know, to make people wonder when you're out at the grocery store, when you're getting gasoline, when you're at the gym, I mean, this, this guy's at the gym, pumping gasoline, gasoline, looks like a Starbucks to me, grocery store, subway, gas station. I put all the Mr. Yuck. I love the Mr. Yuck because it really, really kind of captures the moment. I mean, this is yuck. I mean, how do you know what's on these scrubs? How do you know where these people were? Were they working in an ICU? Were they in an operating room? What, what were they doing? And you don't know. And you sit down next to this guy. He has an open seat on the train, and he has antibiotic resistant C. diff. And you put it on your, get it on your scrubs. You take it home. You go to visit your great grandmother. She's immunocompromised. She gets it. It could be a game changer. I mean, that's a fatal event in some people. You know, this just reiterates and highlights antibiotic resistant strands. You know, MRSA, VRE, C. diff. I mean, these are deadly bacteria. I mean, antibiotic res resistant C. diff kills people every single day. It kills people in their 80s who come in with toxic megacolon, they get systemic sepsis, multi-system multi organ failure, and they die. Um, Vancomycin-resistant enterococcus is very, very difficult to, you know, to treat in patients who, have, who are um, sick and have multiple medical comorbidities. You know, we know, we know MRSA causes significant morbidity and mortality. Lots of healthcare dollars are spent just trying to manage this bacteria. And, and over here, I put this up because Really, these are the numbers that I kind of want everybody to keep in mind. I mean, 92% of scrubs worn by hospital personnel at the end of a shift have these three things on. I mean, I think that's an impressive statistic. You know, washing hands, every, we, I wash my hands and my patients will tell you, before I see a patient and after I see every patient, that's twice for every patient. And you know, you'd be amazed how many people in the hospital don't wash their hands. It's, it's mind boggling, but you know, this is something that people have attacked and they have made incredible progress with. They have the Purell containers outside of every room. Um, they encourage it. They've done studies and, and physicians and staff have changed their behavior as a result. So washing hands, it's become less of an issue, although it still is one. When we talk about that is washing hands versus surgical attire. You know, what's worse, you know, washing hands clearly is a big issue, but surgical attire or hospital attire is another big issue. You know, com comparable to hand washing, there is an equally important risk from, con from contaminated scrubs aiding in the transfer of resilient and deadly pathogens to patients and the general public. I mean, that's, we know that. I mean, this isn't, you know, this isn't a secret. And, you know, this is what I want to highlight again. I mean, this is a persistent problem. This is a rampant problem. You know, people work all day. They take their scrubs home, they put them in the regular wash, and home laundered systems just can't do it. I mean, the University of Cincinnati studied this, and they found that MRSA and VRE isolates can survive for 90 days. Not 90 minutes, not 90 hours, not 90 seconds, 90 days. So you take those scrubs home, throw them in the wash, you think you're laundering them, you're not. I mean, 90 days is a long time. So we're not talking just scrubs, we're talking lab coats, privacy drapes, all that stuff. I mean, this is, this is really incredible. And they can't be killed unless you get to 160 degrees Fahrenheit, which you know, the vast majority of home laundry systems just cannot accomplish. So hospital personnel leaving work in contaminated scrubs, home laundering them and returning to work in those scrubs, places the patients at risk for hospital acquired infections and surgical site infections. And you know, families and the public at risk as well. I put a question mark there because, you know, you go back and I mean, let's go back on the slides, please, I apologize. But if you go back to this, I mean, I don't know, you know, after this talk, are you gonna wanna sit next to this guy on the train? You know, maybe, or you might not, after the talk, you might not think it's that big a deal, but you know, to me, this is, I don't know where he's been. I don't know what he's done. If you sit down on the train and, and he drops a VRE on me or C. diff, you know, that's a problem. Now, a lot of people say, look, this train is filled with bacteria. There's absolutely no question, but it's filled with community bacteria. It's filled with bacteria that are antibiotic sensitive. It's filled with bacteria that you can manage. On here, if you have an antibiotic resistant C. diff, excuse me, I'm sorry about that. Do you have antibiotic resistant C. diff on here? No, that's a whole different ballgame. 
So I apologize about that, and I appreciate your patience. But you know, essentially, those people that you saw on that slide, they're serving as a vector. They're transmitting drug-resistant bacteria all around the environment for you, your children, your family, and everybody to really be exposed to. And you know, for children to be exposed to something like VRE or anabacteria C. diff, that, that's pretty significant. So this is an incredible burden. If you look at the healthcare provide, providing network, the insurance companies, you know, they are all over this. This is a big, big issue, particularly with CMS or Medicare. You know, hospital acquired infections cost an incredible amount of money. They result in an incredible length of stay for patients. Um, they result in debilitation, in mortality, in morbidity, excuse me, morbidity, and a change in quality of life. And you know, this number says, so surgical site infections impact over 157,000 patients. I think that number is incredibly conservative. The, the, the cost is about $21,000 per occurrence. I think that number is incredibly conservative. You know, and what they're saying is 33.7% of the nation's total hospital acquired infections are surgical site infections. So not only are the hospital acquired infections costing money, but the surgical site infections are costing money because everybody's walking around in scrubs that are contaminated with bacteria and potentially propagating or promoting or exacerbating this issue. You know, this is $3.3 billion dollars 3.3 billion dollars, it's a lot of money. And if you took that money and put it into different aspects of healthcare management, for example, if you put it into preventive care or immunizations or research, imagine where you could be. You know, 3.3 billion dollars annually. And I think that number is conservative. I think that's half of what it is, at least. Now, hospital acquired infections account for, this says 10 billion annually. That's just directly related to the infection. I mean, $10 billion, it's an incredible amount of money. And that's just to treat the infection. This next number is going to demonstrate, this is all of the collateral damage, so to speak. You know, there's indirect healthcare costs and an additional 35 to $45 billion annually in indirect and shifted costs. And I think if you think about that indirect cost, that goes into things like Patients are discharged to a skilled nursing facility or a rehab facility. Um, then they go from there to home. And then when they're at home, they have, um, you know, they have a visiting nurse or they have an open wound or they need a vac or they need wound care products or they need antibiotics or they need medication or they need durable medical equipment. I mean, $45 billion, that number is staggering. And, you know, this, it, it, if you want to be simple about it, you could trace it all back to a pair of dirty scrubs. I mean, it's a simplified version, but... You know, look, I mean, it might be related to that. So I appreciate everybody's interest in patients. I did get done a little early. I, I apologize about that. I was trying to go uh, slow and thoughtful and deliberate. But I'm looking forward to see if anybody out there has any thoughts or questions. You know, the purpose of this talk really was to generate awareness to a problem that I really feel is rampant and that I'm passionate about. I see this in hospitals every day where people come and go without regard for their attire and how it may be impacting not only healthcare, but the healthcare industry and the public at large. So thank you everybody. And if there are any questions, please, please let me know. Thanks, that was great, John. We have got a few that have come in. Um, we'll start off with an easy one, I hope. What do you advise for staff who state they're allergic to the detergents used by a professional laundry? Yeah, this is a common question. I'll tell you what, and some of those detergents smell horrific. I, I'll, they make fun of me. I'll sit in the OR uh, locker room and I'll smell all the scrubs until I find one that doesn't have, that doesn't smell like that commercial laundered uh, system. And you know, what we have done is approach the commercial laundering uh, provider and say, look, you know, we have folks. And so what they've done is they've actually said, look, we re recognize and realize that. So they've changed their wash method in terms of the detergents that they use to try and accommodate it. It's, you know, it's not an easy thing. And I know some people are allergic to some detergents, but they assure me that they use this hypoallergenic material as best that they can. 
Um, but I'm sensitive to it. I know exactly what you mean. I mean, I'll pick up a pair of scrubs and they'll smell terrible. I'll put them right down and pick up another pair. But I think it's a, it's a reasonable thing. But, you know, to say to somebody, look, because the hospital system can't launder the scrubs because of your allergy or whatever, I think that's a dangerous, it's a slippery slope argument because taking them home is worse. So I think what we've done is approach our, you know, our laundering uh, system and spoken to them about it. They've been really good about it. Uh, and I think that's an easy fix, but I know everybody may not have access to that, but that's what we've done in this work. Okay, that's great. I've now got a question about the, the color of scrubs. Um, is it really easier for the patient to identify staff or staff to identify each other? Because every hospital has a different color scheme, which would be confusing for a patient who has gone to a different hospital. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree, and that's why uh, the hospitals typically will provide the patient some sort of explanation and or uh, key, code key to help them. And the staff that come in will say, and it's a, an educational thing, they'll say, I'm from respiratory, I'm wearing brown scrubs, and anybody else you see wearing brown scrubs will be from the respiratory department. So it's a little bit of a reorientation, it's a little bit of a, um, a break in period, but you know, the, the the patients pick up on it quickly. You know, obviously the patients, the things that they're looking for, I want to know where my nurse is and that, and they want to be able to identify nurses quickly. And I think that's where this came out of because a lot of nurses, and I'm sure we've all been there, you go on a floor and the scrub market has provided so many options that nurses will be wearing all types of different scrubs. And I found it confusing myself, but when the nurses all have to wear blue, and you're in the intensive care unit, and the nurse comes in and says, anybody in blue is a nurse in the intensive care unit, the patients quickly pick up on it. And you'd be amazed. I mean, the patients, you know, patients say, look, she's over there, she's in blue, she's a nurse. Um, so I agree that different hospitals have different systems, but I think if you adapt the system in the hospital, explain to the patients and orient them, they all seem to do really well. Okay, that's great. Um, I've got another question here. I work in the OR. I wear personal scrubs to work. However, I change into hospital provided scrubs when I'm at work. Is this an acceptable um, or allowable practice? I think, you know, I think it's acceptable. Um, I, I'm assuming what you do is you take your scrubs, put them in your locker, put on the hospital-based scrubs, work all day, and then put your scrubs and go home. I think it's, you know, it's the same as wearing clothing in from the world. You know, some people wear jeans and a shirt. I think it's okay. I think that, you know, the issue is when, if you go home and go to the grocery store, I may have put a picture up of you um, and I'm accusing you innocently of being one of those people. But I, I, that's the one thing I think, you know, I slide a little bit on and a lot of people do that. Um, I don't think it's as big a deal, but it's hard to differentiate who those people are in the, in the real world um, versus whether they've just walked out of the hospital. Okay, that's great. So, um, another attendee has said this is a really helpful topic. However, nowadays when you go to restaurants, people bring their pets. I'm allergic to many pets, pet dander. I'd rather sit by someone with scrubs than a pet. <laughs> what about this issue? Yeah, I mean, I... I'm sensitive to that. I mean, I have allergies. You know, if somebody brought a cat in, I'd be the same way. I could pick, I could pick up a cat in a room in about six seconds. I think, you know, you have to kind of separate it out and break it down. And I mean, if you're a young, younger, healthy patient, the likelihood of you getting some sort of incapacitating infection from antibiotic resistant C. diff may be lower. But I think if you look at your the ability of those scrubs to serve as a vector to transmit that bacteria into the community and potentially infect somebody who is susceptible, I think that's where I, I'm trying to create awareness. I mean, I understand that it's, I, I believe me, I understand, and you know, it's an abstract concept. If you say, look, I am, I can't directly relate to how what I'm wearing to the restaurant could cause this, but you know, if you think about it, if you leave the hospital and you have some antibiotic resistant bacteria on you and you go out into a restaurant of all the people you interact with and then that antibiotic resistant bacteria is on them and then they take it home to their great grandmother and they get C. diff and die, 
I, I don't know, it might be a dramatic answer. It might be, you know, some people might say it's not plausible, it's not real, but I think it's, I think it's a reality. I think that this is a real problem. I, I'm sympathetic to the fact that, look, you'd rather sit next to somebody who's wearing scrubs, but I think if you look at, the, and it, if I can remove the problem, you don't have to worry about it at all. You can sit next to and somebody not wearing scrubs and not worry about the dog. If I can remove the problem and create awareness for people to say, look, I'm not gonna leave the hospital and the outfit I wore all day, I'm gonna change into clothes and then go to the restaurant, then we don't have to worry about it. Okay, so, so how do you suggest we can combat the whole issue of um, not wearing scrubs outside of the hospital? <laughs> you know, it's a huge task to tackle. I, and I think, you know, one of, I think people need mechanisms and education. I think education first is key, and then they need, a, as you know, I mean, when people go to work, they're often running late. They're just about getting there on time. Then they have to go. They have to do sign out if it's nurse, if it's a physician they're running. They're, everybody's always running. Time seems to be short. And I think you need an easy solution that people can adapt to quickly, learn quickly, and find productive. So you know, do I have that solution? I know, you know, Rep Scrubs has a product for reps from you know vendor from the vendor industry to manage this in the operating room does this have an application or you know to the general population of the hospital it doesn't but you know one I think the first initial step would be education which would be education for the staff to say look this is what you're doing and providing areas where staff can change into this clothes they're going to wear all day then they drop those clothes off for the hospital to launder and they leave in their regular clothes. I think education and facility is, is the biggest issue. And I think that's, you know, that's where you struggle. People don't have the facilities, they don't have the locations, they can't do it. And it's, you know, it's obviously gonna be a culture change that's gonna require a lot of time and a lot of effort. Okay, that's great. You, you mentioned at the facility you trained in, you wore scrubs outside the organization. How do you recommend an organization begins to tackle this very touchy issue? Yeah, it, it, it's a great question, and I'll tell you, I, you know, I think they turn a blind eye. I think, you know, they look at it and say, you know, I can't, it's impossible for me to control this. It's really difficult for me to control this, and I think they say, I think they look at it as the question about sitting next to the dog. You know, it's hard for some people to really quantify what impact it's having on the real world. Um, so, you know, what some people, like when I was trained at Jefferson, there's, a, you know, they'd have the big letters or it'd be emblazoned that you're stealing the scrubs if you walk out. Um, you know, having people manage these areas where people come and go, like the operating room, where if you work in the neonatal ICU, you come, you get a pair of scrubs, you put your clothes in a locker and you have somebody who manages that, that's the easiest way to do it. But finding a full-time equivalent person to sit and manage scrubs all day, a lot of hospitals just don't have it in their budget and it just doesn't happen. So you're counting on this kind of honor system within the hospital. And, you know, for me, it's a real sensitive issue because most people, when their mechanisms break down and they're tired and hungry and they want to go home and see their family or they just want to go home, you know, the first thing they're going to do is say, well, I'm just going to walk out. There's nobody regulating it. There's nobody watching it and they just do it. And I think that's part of the problem. There's no, we have no mechanism in place to regulate it. And it's a challenge. Now, you know, the product we have for the operating room, we regulate it and it's very specific for that environment. You know, could that be applied across the board? It would be great. I think, you know, that's a, I think that's something that would be way down the road. But, you know, I think people's awareness and need to understand the problem is the most important thing. But it's, it's a great question. Now, would the disposable scrubs be an alternative for the detergent allergen OR staff? I think so. The disposable scrubs are very, you know, there's almost no, you know, there's, they don't really smell at all. Um, there's no allergenic component to it. And the disposable scrubs are, it's an easy solution. So you get the, you get a pair of disposable scrubs, you wear them all day. Um, the, the rep scrubs product has a time badge on it. So it tells you how long you've been wearing it. It could be modified for eight to 12 hours. At the end of your eight to 12 hour shift, you know that the scrubs need to go. You take them off, you throw them away, you walk out on your clothes. You know, it's it's a great it's a great solution, and it's one that I would love to see employed universally in the hospital because I think 
this is a topic that we have kind of pushed under the rug, but I think as healthcare progresses in the next, you know, 50 years, infection management and control of the infectious environment are going to be very important. And we've seen it. CMS already is paying for quality versus quant, you know, versus quantity. So I mean, if you, if a patient comes back to the hospital, a hospital-based infection, the hospital's not getting paid. And, you know, so the hospital wants to know what components went into that process and why did the patient get an infection? What can we do to change it? Because we're losing money. And, you know, I think this is, this is a real big issue. Disposable scrubs would solve the problem. You could have different colors if you want for different areas, but it would solve it. Okay, that's great. Just going back to your um, about rep scrubs and the disposables, how did you come up with the eight hour expiration on the use of, the, of your scrub? So the eight hour expiration was, you know, it was to create a timestamp for people to know how long that person's been in the operating room. It's somewhat of an arbitrary time, but eight hours is a pretty long time. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a shift, so to speak. It'd be seven to three. So if that person was in your operating room from seven to three, you know they've been there for eight hours and that their scrubs are in a position where they should consider to be replaced or removed. So it really was to kind of conform with the typical eight hour work shift and the time that, you know, the really the normal time in terms of maximum that somebody would wear into the operating room. Okay, and actually staying on disposable scrubs, um, we have a question, are these disposable scrubs environmentally friendly? Yes, they are. So they can be taken and they can be recycled and reused. Yep, they are. It's a good question. Okay, um, and leading on to another one. What about trips out of the operating room, for example, to the cafeteria for lunch? Do you advise changing each time? Yeah, we all, look, I've, when I was a resident, I would do it all the time, you know, because you don't have a lot of time. So you run down to the cafeteria in your scrubs, grab something, eat there, run back up to the OR. Uh, and, you know, this problem, I'll just take this little aside, you know, this problem really hit home for me when, you know, when you're a resident, it's, you're not the guy, but when you're an attending and that patient is under your care and, you know, they get a wound infection, uh, that's a big deal. And, you know, from, in my world in vascular surgery, if they have a prosthetic device and they get a wound infection, it could be life or limb altering. And I really began to take notice about who was really paying attention to their, to the, to the premise of minimizing the patient's infectious risk. So, you know, back in the day when I was a resident, a lot of people would put on, they'd have these over, like these cover jackets. They'd all be hanging it's on, right next to the OR door. You'd throw this cover jacket on, cover up your scrubs, run down, get some meat, and then run back up and do it. I'll tell you what I do. I change scrubs between every single patient operation. And if I have to leave the OR, I always wear my white coat. And if I have to leave in scrubs, but when I come back, I change again and put on a clean pair of scrubs. And, you know, that's because at the flip side, I've seen, you know, if I, my patient gets an infection, I want to know that I did every single thing I personally could do to minimize that. So I change every time, and if I leave and come back, I change. It's not practical and it's frustrating, but I do it. Okay, this kind of question carries on from that. What about trips out of the hospital to another healthcare facility? Yeah, that's, a, I mean, in my mind, that's a big no-no. I mean, you got to take those scrubs off and put on clothes. You know, and, and vendor, you know, we see this in the vendor world, the vendor reps, you know, they'll come into my OR, uh, they'll be done with me, and then they'll go into another, they'll walk out of my hospital in those scrubs, get in their car, drive to the hospital, you know, 20 miles away, and do a case there. And, you know, for me, this is a real problem. And if, let's just say for the sake of argument that they were doing a case on a patient who had a VRE, they walk out. They get in their car, they drive to the next hospital, they walk in that OR, and, you know, that person then gets a, a wound infection, and that, how can you tell me you can't definitively link it potentially to that vector transmission which happened with that, you know, with that vendor rep? And, you know, the reality is that reps are present in ORs in 60% of cases. You know, in the vascular world, the orthopedic world, the cardiovascular world, they're there because the the reps pr help provide the product, they provide guidance on using the product, and they're a necessary component of this whole process. I mean, a lot of healthcare can't happen without the reps providing guidance to the use of their products. It's just, 
people leaving the hospital and coming from one facility to another, you have to change. You have to. Okay, and this is kind of leading on again. How often do you wash your white coats and have you seen a decrease in your specific patient SSIs slash HAIS? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, <laughs> the, the white coat, um, I get commercially laundered. And, you know, I try to do it about once a week or so. It's a good question, though. And I, I wonder about it all the time. Um, you know, your white coat, I'll take it and wear it from the ICU back to my office, you know, um, up on the floors. I, I think about it all the time. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. And it's a good question. Okay. You know, and I'll admit, I'll admit, I'll concede that I every time, <laughs> so funny when somebody asks it, every time I put that white coat on, I'm thinking to myself, I want to trace my steps. And it's funny, sometimes I'll think that if I start in the clean area at the ICU and then do rounds and change the dressing up on the floor, that somehow I've done it better rather than going the other way where I start up on the floor and go down the ICU. So somehow I'm kind of talking myself into the fact that it's okay, but I'm not, you know, it doesn't sit well with me. Now, are the disposable scrubs more cost-effective than a scrub dispensing system? Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you that disposable scrubs take the cost of the scrub uh, dispensing system out of the hospital. So, you know, the, the disposable scrub um, port, so to speak, that rep scrubs has transfers the cost of the scrub. I mean, scrubs, I mean, as you know, everybody knows, I mean, scrubs walk out of the hospital. I mean, they leave in droves. I know my hospital told me, my CEO told me they lose five to six thousand dollars a month in scrubs that walk out, and that's just lost money. You imagine if you could save, you know, a third of that from the reps that are taking your scrubs. So it's absolutely a cost saver because the the cost is transferred from the hospital to the rep themselves that have to pay for the pair of scrubs. So you know, the scrubs themselves, the hospital doesn't have to pay for. The machine is placed without a cost to the hospital. And then the rep comes in and they pay for the scrubs individually. They have an, they have an internet web-based account. They give their credit card and they just, you know, provide their information, their pin code when they get there to get the scrubs and that's how it's done. So it's absolutely cost savings. Okay, um, before we actually move on, can I just ask you to move on to your contact slide so that the attendees uh, can absolutely. make a note of your address. If you need to contact John, he's, Details are up on the screen for you. Um, okay, we can move on to another question, John. Do you foresee any North American market, market regulation at state or federal level specific to scrub change rate, change rate or laundering process? Yeah, that's a great question. Somebody's reading my mind out there. I can tell you that. Uh, I would love to see it. I think that it's something that can unquestionably happen. I think you need to, I think this is a topic that CMS has been made aware of and that they've had conversations about and that they understand completely. I think managing it is something that people have a hard time wrapping their, their, their head around, but I think it's out there, it's on the table and they know it exists. Would I love to see it? Absolutely. Now, you know, regulation, it might be tough. It might be tough to regulate immediately. I think if you get suggestions or in place from the Joint Commission or from CMS in reference to hospital attire and how it should be done initially, and then you can regulate it going forward so that you can control this. But that would be the absolute way to control it. You know, if, C if Medicare came out, and please, I'm not. I don't want anybody to record this and send it to Medicare and say, but you know, if Medicare came out and said, look, this is the policy you need to have in your hospital to adhere to our standards and to continue to participate in Medicare reimbursement systems from a quality perspective, you know, it could change the whole game. I think that's not an easy thing to do up front, but I think doing baby steps and starting with a population like Rep Scrubs has started with the with the vendors. So you start with that population and demonstrate the efficacy of this product, which we already have. And then you apply it to a larger scale and an even larger scale. That is a way to do it, um, but it's going to take it's going to take time, and it's not going to happen easily because there's a lot of resistance to do this. Um, you know, people don't. That's why I'm so passionate about it. Is I think a lot of people don't understand it, but I think if you break it down like we did today and say, look, you know, if you walk out of the hospital with VRE, you get in your car, and then the next tomorrow morning you put the same scrubs on and go and do another case somewhere, 
really you're not doing anybody any service. You're doing a disservice to potentially exposing a Medicare beneficiary to an infection that could result in significant morbidity or potentially mortality. I think, yeah, I think Medicare is aware of that. I think they're, you know, they understand the potential complexities of it. Okay, we've got time for one last question. Um, can you recommend a way to present this to the powers to be to fight for the need for hospital provided scrubs for all employees? Yeah, that's another, if somebody's reading my mind, somebody's pretty good out there. Uh, you know, the problem with the hospital, and I think anybody who's involved in hospitals in a high level knows, is that, you know, their margin is thin, it's razor thin, and you know, saying to them, look, you got to spend money, it, it's saying to them up front, look, you have to spend this money to help solve a potentially abstract problem. And not everybody gets it. So if you say, look, you got to spend, say, $200,000 annually to provide everybody with scrubs because it's going to help reduce your risk of hospital acquired infections and surgical site infections, which at the end of the day, in the long run, is going to save you a significant amount of money that you're losing by patients coming back and you're not getting reimbursed for that. That's the argument that has to be made. But it's a tough one because up front, I think it's hard. It's a hard sell for some for some facilities. They're saying, "Well, you know, I can't measure that. I can't quantify it. You can't prove that to me." So that's a bit, you know, that's going to be a big expense up front for me. But I think as time goes on, and I think as we are able to demonstrate that this has an impact on patient care, and you can um, provide clinical information that strongly supports that, I think you're not going to have any choice. I think the hospitals are going to say, "This is how we have to do it." because it's going to impact their bottom line if they don't do it that way. Okay, that's great. Thank you so very much, John, for a great and very informative webinar. Um, and thanks again, obviously, to our sponsor, Reb Scrubs. Uh, just a reminder that one lucky attendee today will win an Amazon gift card for completing the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. For more information on our upcoming OR Today webinar, please visit our website, ortoday.com forward slash webinars. Thanks once again for joining us and hope to see you next time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.